The Bible says here, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So notice that the verse does not say, whoso findeth the wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Because there isn't only one wife for you. There isn't this, just this, the one that God has picked out for you and we are like sort of on this pilgrimage journey trying to identify who this woman is. So it doesn't say the wife because there's more than, there's more than one option. And I want to give you a couple of thoughts just on, on this, uh, this concept of the one. That you know, even if God had, and he doesn't, I don't believe this, but even if God had only one woman picked out for you, right, that you had to try and identify and marry, how would you even do it? How would you even identify this woman? Do you know what I mean? So, 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 we, so this person, this, these people believe that, you know, we have to try and find this, the one, but have no way of identifying it. Because cause let's go through the options, right? One, number one is you try and identify her using God's word. And don't get me wrong, and this is what I'm going to preach on in the next couple of weeks, is yes, we use Bible principles to try and help us decide who, are the, who is the right and wrong person to marry, but the Bible does not specify individuals. So you're not going to read in the Bible, you know, Victor is to marry, you know, this person. Unless maybe you're Muhammad, right? I don't, I don't, know, I don't know the Quran. Does, does it tell, you know, it says like, we gave, you know, Zaid's ex-wife, right? I'm just reading. I, I just, I just going to need to read this to you because I, why you guys are here. I've been studying my Quran. <laughs> I, I need to read you guys this verse because this is the, the stupidest thing. Oh, where is it? Uh, 33, I think. You know, unless you're Muhammad, right? Maybe, maybe then your word says who you can marry and who you can't marry. Look at this. So basically, Zaid is a guy, is his adopted son, and then uh, he divorces his wife, and then Muhammad wants to marry uh, his adopted son's wife. Then look what it says here. This is Surah 33, so chapter 33, verse um, 37. Then when Zaid had dissolved his marriage, so he divorced his wife with her, we joined her in marriage to you, talking about Muhammad, right? In order that in future they may, there may be no difficulty to the believers in the matter of marriage with the wives of their adopted sons when the latter have dissolved their marriage with them and Allah's command must be fulfilled. So the, the Quran is saying here that we gave Zaid's ex-wife to Muhammad so that there's no doubt, there's no question about whether or not it's right and wrong to marry your adopted son's ex-wife. So maybe if you read the Quran, and the Quran is your word of God, it does tell you. Muhammad's reading it and thinking, oh yeah, like it does tell me who I can and can't marry. But look at what it says here about Muhammad. This is, this is the same chapter. I've got to share this, guy, this with you. <laughs> chapter 33, verse 50. It gives, it gives Muhammad more direction on who he can and can't marry. O oh, Prophet, verse 50. We have made lawful to you your wives, to you to whom you have paid their dowers, and to whom your right hand possesses out of the captives of war, whom Allah has assigned to you, and daughters of your paternal uncles and aunts, and daughters of your maternal uncles and aunts who migrated with you, and any believing woman who gives herself to the Prophet if the Prophet wishes to wed her. This only for you and not for the believers at large. So he's saying here that Muhammad can marry all these different people. He's not limited to four, right? And, 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 and he can marry whoever he wants. But you know what's funny? It's only reserved for him. Only Muhammad the prophet can do that and nobody else. And you're telling me that this is the word of God. I, I just got to share one more verse with you because I read this. This is the same chapter. And I read this is the stupidest thing I've ever read. And you just tell me if you think it's a stupid. Look at this. This is verse 53, uh, Surah 33. O you who believe, enter not the prophet's houses. So the prophet's houses, not the prophet's house. Enter not the prophet's houses until leave is given you for a meal. And then, not so early as to wait for its preparation, but when you are invited, enter, and when you have taken your meal, disperse, without seeking familiar talk. Such behavior annoys the prophet. He is shy to dismiss you, but Allah is not shy to tell you the truth. And when you ask his ladies for anything you want, ask them from before a screen that makes for greater purity for your hearts and for theirs. Nor it is right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger or that you should marry his widows after him at any time. Truly such a thing is in Allah's sight and enormity. Did you catch what that was saying? It's saying here, like, when you enter, when you go to Muhammad's house, I'm going to show this verse to that guy today, Ash, and we got I want to see what he says. But, 
you, do you hear what I say? He's saying, if you go to the prophet's house, you know, only go if you're invited for a meal. So don't go any other time. And, and don't go so early to wait for the meal. You need to just come when he invites you for that meal, when the meal is ready. But then it also says, but don't stay so long for chit chat because that annoys the prophet. But he's too shy to tell you that it annoys him. So Allah is going to tell you that it annoys him. And then the last thing it says here is, it says, you know, nor is it right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger or that you should marry his widows after him at any time. Truly such a thing is in Allah's sight an enormity. So, so Muhammad, it's okay for him to marry Zaid's ex-wife. It's all, all right for him to marry wives that are divorced, but nobody can marry Muhammad's ex-wives. Even after he dies, no, nobody can touch his wives. And in fact, if you want to talk to them, talk from behind a screen, you know, to, to preserve your purity in theirs. Uh, anyways, I thought that was interesting. I just wanted to share that with you. All right. <clears throat> Oh, let's go back on to your topic. So, you know, God's word, that's why I got into it. So God's word, it doesn't identify an individual. So the Bible doesn't tell you who to marry, right? And that's why, how could you know? How could you know that this is God's will for me to marry when the Bible doesn't even mention it, you know? So you could never have that assurance. So number one, you couldn't use God's word. Or number two, could you use your emotion? Because some people say, like, I know this is the one because I, would, I wouldn't feel this way otherwise. You know, and the, you know, when I'm around them, I've just swept off my feet and, you know, all this... You know, but, you know we, we know in Jeremiah 17 that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So when it comes to deciding who to marry, your heart is the worst thing to use to, to determine who to marry and who isn't. So emotion, number two. Or well, number three, this, this is a big one, is circumstances, right? The circum they'll say like, you know, well, this is the one because this happened and this happened and this happened and it's just too coincidental that all these things could happen. <coughs> Now the problem with circumstances is that, is that they're relative and they're subjective, right? It's like when you're trying to shop for a car, right? You're shopping for a car, you start noticing those cars on the street because that's what you're thinking about. You know, you want to you buy a phone and you start noticing, you know, you're thinking of switching to Samsung because you're sick of Apple and you start realizing, oh, you've got a Samsung too, you've got a Samsung, I'll show you. So you notice, oh man, everybody does have Samsungs, not everyone has an iPhone. Because that's, because it's subjective and relative because you're noticing it, now it's going to be on your mind, you're going to notice it more. So, you know, it's, it, and, you know is, is God working through circumstances, isn't he? Who knows, right? It's, not some, it's something that you have to believe. It's not something that you can prove. You can believe that God spoke to you and God is leading you and doing these things. And, and you know, rightly so, he can be. But it's something that we believe. It's something we take by faith. It's not something that we can just know because it's not in the Bible. And circumstances can be the opposite. It could be Satan also. It could be your own heart. It could be a lot of things. So that's why inevitably when it comes to circumstances, we need to use the word of God to cut out what circumstances would be the will of God and what are not. So it's something you have to believe. You cannot prove one way or another. Circumstances can be interpreted uh, in the direction that you already desire. It's relative and subjective. And you know, when I, when I think about circumstances um, leading to... Uh, Genesis 24, leading to who you're going to marry. <clears throat> like, you know, people ask for a sign. They'll say like, oh, this is the woman that I should marry. Then, you know, if I, if I send her a request on Facebook and she accepts my friend request, then maybe that's, that, that's the woman that I need to marry. <laughs> you know, asking for a sign. When I think of these circumstances and signs that people, people uh, try and uh, believe, I always think of, of this passage, and maybe you're thinking of it too. You're saying, what about um, Isaac and Rebekah and, and Abraham's servant? You know, he went and he said, you know, if the lady does this, then I'll say that that's, that's the one, right? So let's just read through that passage and I'll give you some thoughts. Genesis 24, so the servant has now come to uh, this land to find a, a wife for Isaac. And he, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. 
And it came to pass before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hastened and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hastened and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel of weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So I would say this is the story that a lot of people will go to to say, you know, see, look, you know, you can ask for a sign and God will show you that sign and, and point you in the direction of the person that you are to marry. Now, a couple of things I just want to point out about this verse is number one, when the sign, I guess the, 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 he wasn't looking for a sign, I don't think. I think the servant was looking for an attribute, right, of a woman. Because he wasn't just giving some arbitrary sign like, oh, you know, if, if I'm standing here today at church and she walks past me and then that's a sign from God that that's the one I should marry. Or, you know, if God puts us in, into the same youth group or in the same classroom together, then that, that's, I'll take that as a sign from God that this is the girl I'm meant to marry. You know, this is just some arbitrary sign that doesn't mean anything. Whereas the sign he was looking for, he was looking for an attribute, right? He's saying, if I ask for a drink of water, what sort of woman is not just going to draw water for me, but also draw water for all my camels? So it's a, it's a woman that is not only hardworking, but she's considerate. And also, he didn't go and look for the women at, at, you know, at the nightclub in, in, the, in that place. He didn't go and look for the woman at the hairdressing salon. He went to look for the women at the well. So it's the women that are working hard, going and getting, get, you know, doing the housework and getting their jobs done. They're going down to the well to draw water. So, you know, you need to look for a girl in the right places as well. So he's looking for a girl in the right place. She's coming to do some work. She's hardworking. She's considerate. <clears throat> he's looking for an attribute. He's not just got some arbitrary sign. Now, the other thing is, in this situation, uh, point number two is, He's not the vested party, right? So the, the servant is not looking for a wife for himself. He's looking for a wife for his, his master's son. So when he's asking this sign, there's no bias here. He's not, he's not asking for a sign, but he's the one looking for the wife. And this is where it's dangerous when you try and take this principle and say, well, I'm going to apply this sign and look for it. It's going to be, you know, you know it's, it's, you're just going to find those circumstances that are convenient because you're a vested party. You want to marry this girl and you're looking for signs that line up and, and it's just a dangerous way and not a wise way to do things. <clears throat> so it wasn't just like an arbitrary sign. Uh, I think he was looking for certain attributes. So people use, try and use God's word. People try and use emotion. People try and use circumstance. Another one I've heard is people try and use obedience. And they'll say that, um, you know, it was often told to me when I was going to a, a Presbyterian church, was saying, you know, the, the way you find your wife is if you're walking in the will of God and you're obedient, God will direct your path and direct you to the woman you need to marry. <laughs> Where, you know, I would ask the question, or if that's the case, if, if the will of God is like a target that you have to hit, as opposed to what step you have to take day by day, which is what I believe obedience, because obedience is, you know, what do I do today, right? Do, do I do this or do that? What's the right step to take? And I take this step, right? And you have to decide, because there could be multiple options, you know? Like, what church to go to? There can be multiple options. There can be this church, that church. We know God wants us in church, but which church you need to decide? God's God's will and being obedient to God is not going to decide which church that you went to this morning. And it's the same. If the will of God is this target that you have to hit along the way, then the question is how obedient do you have to be to make sure that you're not going off the, off, astray off the path and to make sure that you hit the target? 
So if you have to be obedient all the way to lead you to your wife, then is anybody obedient enough to know for sure that God has led them to that person? And the other thing is, you know, like I said, obedience comes from the word of God, but it doesn't make decisions for you where there are multiple choices, you know? And in the case of finding who the wife is, there, there are multiple choices. So you're going to end up back at situation one to three, which is how do you then decide of these choices, who is the right one to marry? So I don't think it's obedience. So it's not, you know, don't use, you won't be able to use God's word. Not that you don't use God's word. You just won't be able to identify an individual. Um, don't use emotion, don't use circumstances, and don't use obedience uh, because it's a choice that you have to make. There are several options. And, it's, you know, it's a, bit like, it's a bit like assurance of salvation. You know, there's, you know, there's no assurance apart from God's word. So if, uh, we only know that we're saved because God's word says if you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life. So if you try and use emotion to guide you as to who to marry, there's, there's no assurance there, right? Because it's no, there's nothing definite about emotion. There's nothing definite about circumstances. There's surely nothing definite about... There's, there's something definite about obedience, that we're not obedient enough. So we need to do the best of our ability and trust that God's grace will help us with the rest. Um, but just like assurance of salvation, if you try and use these methods to determine who is the right one, then uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not going to give you assurance of choosing the right one. So what's the conclusion for today? The conclusion for today is that there isn't this just the one uh, of who you are to marry. The Bible says that we find a wife. It can be, it, there are multiple options out there. And the conclusion is that it's a choice. It's a choice you have to make. You have to decide who you want to marry and who you do not want to marry, who, who you're going to commit to um, and who you're going to serve with your life. And, and like who you're going to, for a lady, who you're willing to follow and submit your authority to because you're going to go from your father to your husband so is this the man that you want to do this with that's really just the, the question you want to ask it's it's the choice is up to you the ball is in your court uh, but we will go over in the next couple of weeks what we should look for because i do believe even though the choice is left up to us god dis, does give us uh, prerequisites and guidelines of what are the no-go zones right so i'll continue that next week and, and the week after all right, so I hope that was interesting for you, this uh, sermon. It gives you a better idea uh, and, and as, as, we, as we build this foundation on this topic. All right, let's pray.